Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. Ken Wu is a doctoral candidate at Duke, researching the history of Christianity. In his work with the Religions in North Carolina Digital Collection, Wu regularly speaks to audiences across the state, introducing the collection and highlights its use for various other kinds of projects. When he's not writing or talking about old texts, so you'll probably find him keeping up with news from his hometown, New York City. Welcome with me, Ken Wu. Thank you, Joanne, and thanks everyone again for coming out. I appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to be with you tonight to talk a little bit about the Religion in North Carolina Digital Collection. It's, it's a project based at Duke that I'm really excited about and really excited to share. Uh, with groups like yours uh, about what we're doing. And so what I'll do tonight is talk a little bit about the collection, um, what it is, uh, how it was conceived, what we're up to today, and then uh, hopefully also get to some interesting stories from the collection, stories that we have preserved digitally uh, in materials that we have in our collection. And then we'll go to some Q&A, I'm sure. Um, you might have some questions after my presentation, and that's what I'm here to do, to talk a little bit about that, answer your questions. So a little bit about the Religion in North Carolina Digital Collection. What is it? Well, essentially our purpose is to gather, uh, to preserve and enhance access to documents that document the religious history, the history of religion and religious bodies in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and we think of ourselves as documenting North Carolina's religious diversity, uh, not only for current generations, but also for generations to come. Uh, to make these types of materials accessible uh, for researchers of all types uh, who want to access them uh, for their various projects. The project uh, itself was begun in 2012. Uh, like I said, it's uh, led by Duke University's Divinity School Library, along with project partners, UNC Chapel Hill and Wake Forest University. Um, and, and we're funded by the federal government. We're actually funded by a grant uh, from the Federal Institute for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, and that grant is administered by the State Library of North Carolina. One of the exciting things about Religion in NC is that it's the only uh, project of its kind. Uh, it's the only uh, digital collection currently that's focused on the topic of religion in a single state. I mean, there are other uh, projects like ours that, 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 that um, make uh, materials available digitally, online, for free, uh, focusing on the cultural history of a state more broadly. We have several of those types of projects in North Carolina. But as far as we know, we're the only collection that focuses on the subject of religion and the history of religion in a single state. So we're hoping uh, to do a good enough job and to be a good model for uh, other projects like this uh, to follow suit. We're in the midst of an initial three-year funding period so we've been given a grant that will run through the middle of uh, 2015, so June 2015 is when our initial three-year funding period uh, will end. And like I said before, our, our, our purpose is to gather, uh, to preserve and enhance access uh, to materials. Uh, we've recently wrapped up the initial phases of scanning, and so we, we're pleased to say that we have 8,000, approximately 8,000 documents available uh, right now uh, that weren't previously available in one place uh, for the public to access freely. Um, these, just to stress, these are materials that were, that, were, that were unavailable before. You could get them if you went to different places and looked at them. But what we've been doing is collecting them, bringing them all to Duke and UNC and Lake Forest, scanning them and making them available online. Who else is working with us? Well, it's a, it's a broad collaborative effort. I mentioned our three project partners, Duke, UNC, and Wake Forest. But in addition to those three partners, uh, contributors to the collection include historical societies, religious organizations, uh, individuals, and library systems, like Durham County Library has contributed to the collection, uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg, another example, Alamance County, Chatham County, there are a number of names up here. Uh, Southern Baptist Historical Society and Archives, um, they've also contributed. We have contributions from Harvard University Library, Yale Library, again, uh, at the initial planning stages of the project, 
uh, we looked for sources relating to North Carolina that might have been in other places outside of the state, and we sought them in order to make them available in our collection. Who are we hoping to reach? Well, different audiences, really. Professional historians uh, are a natural fit, you would think, for a collection like ours. But also students, right? Students who are working on research projects, uh, uh, anywhere from um, college students all the way down to uh, elementary school students, right? Who might be working on uh, a history of a local community uh, or several communities, for example. Uh, congregations and religious bodies, they, they would be interested in our collection, um, perhaps to work up a history of their community, of their congregation. And we've had religious groups contact us about using the collection to, to develop a history of their congregation. Uh, community groups, uh, religion has importance uh, uh, in culture, in cultural history, in society. Uh, so getting to know the history of just a wider community uh, could be benefited by having access to uh, these documents relating to the religious history of the community. Genealogical researchers. So when we conceived this project, this was one group that we hadn't accounted uh, for in terms of a group that would be interested in it. So in the early phases of uploading materials and making them available, uh, we noticed that the, the items that were downloaded the most often were what? Things like church meeting minutes, conference proceedings, directories, like really dry stuff. I mean, who's interested in that? And then it dawned on us. These are materials that correlate names and dates and places. So folks who are interested in family histories, right, genealogies, people want to know where a, a particular person was at a particular time, that's a gold mine for them. And so uh, we believe that that's an audience uh, that's benefiting from the, the project uh, that we're developing. And really anyone with an interest in North Carolina's cultural history, we're hoping uh, will benefit from our efforts to bring these sources uh, together and make them available widely. But really the most exciting part for me uh, as a researcher in uh, history uh, are the fascinating stories that are contained in the collection. Uh, each document tells a story or a number of stories. And one of the most exciting parts of this project for me is the opportunity that we have uh, in developing a collection like this to, um, to preserve these stories, to make sure that they're told and retold and remembered. Uh, one example of this is back in 1897, uh, Mrs. Victoria George Avery published a memoir describing her 11-year-old daughter's remarkable call to Christian ministry and her preaching tour, which included racially mixed audiences uh, from the Carolinas all the way up to Massachusetts. And excerpts of Claretta, that's the, that's the daughter's name, Claretta Nora Avery's sermons and letters of endorsement, you can find these online in that memoir. I wish I could show you tonight. In fact, um, I checked online today. This is one of those sort of uh, weird kind of uh, coincidences. Uh, the Internet Archive, which hosts our collection, never goes offline. But I think with all the storms on the, on the West Coast, their servers, have been, their servers have been affected. And so they're actually offline at the moment. So hopefully uh, by tomorrow, if you're interested, you can actually go to this link online um, and the technology is amazing. This wasn't available even five, ten years ago. You can get up there, you can flip through the book as if you're holding it in your hands. You could, you could search the text in the book. You can print out a PDF version of that book um, and, and keep it for your own uh, research records. You could mark it up. And you could flip through uh, Mrs. Avery's vivid portrait of the quote, wonderful colored girl preacher who crossed racial, right, age, gender, and geographical divisions with her uncommon ministry. Now, let's tell you a little bit about um, the story. So Claretta's father, Moses, was originally from Pensacola, Florida. He grew up in Mobile, Alabama. And he was brought there when he and his mother were freed from slavery by his white father. 
and he was raised in Mobile as an Episcopalian. He distinguished himself in his studies and was one of the few African-American officers in the Union Navy during the, world, during the Civil War. Meanwhile, uh, Victoria, who was Clarita's mother and Moses' wife, she was also born in Pensacola. She was born to Latino and African-American parents. Uh, she knew Moses while they grew up together in Mobile. She survived the Civil War. She escaped an attempt to sell her into slavery. And she fled first to Texas, and then she went alone on horseback into Mexico. Fascinating story. Uh, when she returned to Mobile at the war's conclusion, she found Moses, who was involved in publishing at the time in post-war administration um, and, and, uh, in Louisiana and Alabama. They married, and Claretta was born around 1887. Uh, Moses was devoted to the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, and he was ordained there as a minister at some point during his life. And according to Mrs. Avery, his daughter, Claretta, converted at the tender age of 18 months. She was intelligent, she was outspoken, and at age three, she declared her intention to follow her father's footsteps and preach. And she gave her first sermon, where? In Raleigh, uh, several years later when she was age six. Her mother writes, and I quote, it was certainly marvelous to behold the, common, the command of language, knowledge of the Bible, and power exhibited by her in her first sermon, of one half hour long, delivered to a large congregation. That sermon made her famous. Invitations to preach from churches and from white and colored people in adjoining, adjoining cities and towns poured in upon this tiny little preacher. She goes on to, to describe how despite this fame and this ability to preach, Claretta seems to have had a normal childhood uh, in many other respects is reflected in this, uh, this charming uh, newspaper interview with her that's included there, where she discusses her, uh, her, her dolls at length with reporters. And like I said, you can flip through the pages of this book online. Uh, now, what sorts of audiences would be interested in access to this kind of resource? What do you think? Historians. Historians? Religious, religious people. Yeah, genealogical researchers. Right. Pretty much the same if you had a book. Yeah, right, right. Any, any other thoughts? Journalists. Journalists. Journalists? Journalists. Yeah, absolutely. I think anyone, anyone interested? Fascinating yeah. for anyone. Right, right. There's, there's so much of a complex interplay here, right, between age and race, even geography, right? These barriers that are being crossed in this memoir. An opportunity to take a look at an artifact produced uh, during that time, and to think about the different stories that that could tell. Uh, half a century later, let me uh, advance this here, in 1953, the Jewish community in the railroad town of Wilson, North Carolina, dedicated its first synagogue building. So you have here pictures of, of uh, the dedication program uh, for that service, uh, for their new synagogue building. Uh, this milestone came nearly a century after the first Jewish settlers established a community in that town and began to welcome significant numbers of European Jews into that part of the American South. And so this booklet, uh, which commemorates like, the occasion of the dedication of that synagogue building uh, contains not only the, the order of service for that dedication service, uh, but also many congratulatory messages for Temple Bethel. You see one here from uh, Brown Oil Company of Wilson, North Carolina. Interesting that these businesses, both Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, sent their notes of congratulations, their greetings, uh, their well wishes, uh, widespread support in the community. Again, who would be interested in having access to a document like this? Well, there's a Jewish Historical Society in North Carolina. Sure. And when they organize, I'm sure that would be one of the things that they would be looking for. Right. To see in their, they, they're, they work now for bringing together, I'm sure you have a lot of that material. Yeah. I mean, they, they've done a video of, of the Jewish community in North Carolina. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It goes back and 
1953 is this one. Right? Mm -hmm. And this congregation had been around for 100 years prior to the dedication of their synagogue building. Really, uh, again, the Jewish, the Jewish Historical Society, um, anyone interested in the story of Judaism in the American South, which in itself is a fascinating story. What other documents might you think of uh, to maybe complement this one if you were trying to tell a story? What other documents, what other types of documents might be useful? What do you think? In a membership role. Yeah, membership roles, right? Directories of the congregation. Uh, who was there? What did they do? Cookbooks. And we have cookbooks in the collection. You can flip through cookbooks. Why might a cookbook be interesting to those who are researching or interested in researching the history of Judaism or Jewish community in a particular locale? What do you think? Well, the locations have effects on their diet. Yeah, exactly. Have, you know. Right, through documentary evidence like that, you can trace the story of how well a community kept kosher, for example, or, or when, the, when certain uh, customs began to change over time. So this is, that's just another example of how a document like this that's in the collection might be used alongside of another document, either in this collection or another source, right, resource, uh, to tell a, a more robust story, uh, whether of Temple Beth El, or more broadly, of Wilson, or of Judaism, right, in North Carolina, for example. Going back in time again. In 1916, uh, the renowned composer, musician, and lecturer, Juliet Graves Adams, uh, visited the annual Passion Week services of the Moravian Church in Winston-Salem for the first time. Uh, she, she was a first-time visitor, and she wrote an account of her experience and published it uh, with the Chicago uh, Music News, right, in 1916. And what she does in her piece is she introduces her readers uh, to the Moravian tradition. Uh, she talks about the musical heritage of this tradition, and then she treats them to a rich account of her own experience attending the various services during Easter week in 1916. Mrs. Adam, Adams writes, the dates near the pulpit 1766 to 1916, reveal the fact that the community was established on the former date, and they recently celebrated their 150th anniversary. It is most interesting to imagine the successive stages of growth from the primitive conditions of the old Moravian church of long ago to this up-to-date edifice, simple and unpretentious, yet finished in excellent quiet taste with a good organ, perfect heating, and ventilating and in direct lighting. One feels the welcome extended even before reading, quote, welcome to the home church, end quote. The services for Passion Week are arranged in sequence so that the continuous story of Christ's passion up to and including the resurrection are each in turn celebrated. They're interspersed with the grand old chorals of the church sung by all the people on every occasion. These are sung as a rule for memory, both as to words and music, but the text is furnished for those who do not know them. The worshipfulness and churchly dignity of each service are most impressive. One could not fail to be touched by the message, told as it is in song and story. Now her hosts, the Moravians of Winston-Salem, they were so appreciative of Mrs. Adams' thorough and sympathetic review of her experience as an outsider, that they actually reprinted her article to keep it as a record of the church's history. And that's what this pamphlet is. It is their reprinting uh, of the original article. Uh, Dr. Howard E. Ron Thaler, then president of Salem College, he writes this in his foreword uh, to, the, to the piece. And I quote, it is a great joy to us who are the children of this church to have anew interpreted to us by so sensitive a mind the hidden spiritual meaning of this distinctive Easter service 
which has always been part of our happy spiritual heritage. It is well within our expectation that through the wider publication of this sketch, a deeper understanding will be granted those who may hereafter experience Easter at Salem. A new friend will likewise be gathered who will come under the comfort and inspiration of these services. So all told, what does this pamphlet allow us to do? It allows us to tell the story of an outsider's encounter with a religious community in North Carolina. And I think it also allows us to appreciate uh, the role of religion and religious practices in the wider context of cultural history. And like I said with all these pieces, you can actually go online and you can flip through this book, look at the pictures and everything. It's something that um, we believe very strongly we want to make available to as many people as possible. Uh, other other um, fun examples of items in the collection uh, for the benefit of researchers. Uh, here's an example of a cookbook, uh, What's Cooking in McGavenville, North Carolina, 1959. Um, uh, Disproportionate representation of jello salads, I think, in that one, um, as you can imagine. But this, again, you take a look and you can see, well, what, what, uh, what was making um, its way into these cookbooks, into these church potlucks and suppers at various points in history in different communities. Uh, you could also see maybe what brands were being used. Uh, that'd be an interesting question. What was being bought and sold, for example? These are the kinds of questions historians might bring to sources like these. Whereas somebody from the congregation might have an entirely different purpose for wanting to access this information. Maybe to tell the story of the church in the Cadenville, right? So um, we're making these available for people with different sets of questions and interests so that they can go back in time, as it were, and handle these, these artifacts, uh, these resources. We have the handwritten, handwritten minutes of the original uh, Free Will Baptist Conference in Cape Fear. Again, um, probably very useful for genealogists who would be interested in knowing uh, who was at these meetings. And uh, these minutes in particular being handwritten on paper that's already fading uh, we're really excited to be able to preserve them uh, sort of in archival quality in a digital medium so that they can be uh, used uh, into the future. Buddhism and barbecue. This is, this is a, a much more recent um, work, but, but I think it does point up uh, an important aspect of our collection. We aspire to be the religion in North Carolina digital collection. Um, admittedly, uh, the vast majority of our resources originate from Christian communities. Part of that is because of the fact that there's just a disproportionate number of Christians in North Carolina, and Christianity has um, a, a, a more prominent place in the cultural history of the state. And also, another reason is that um, the records kept by these churches are so complete um, and we learned this as we went out trying to seek similar documents from other religious traditions that, 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 that certain groups just didn't keep a record of their life together in the same way. So that's challenged our thinking some and encouraged us to, uh, as a move into the future, anticipate ways of, 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 of um, taking in resources other than documents, uh, written things, right? thinking about images maybe, uh, maybe even recordings in the future. Um, but this is a, an example of a, of a Buddhist resource that we have in the collection, and this is, a, this is a directory of Buddhist temples and communities in North Carolina that was produced in 2001. Another interesting story um, that we have told in part in the collection is the story of the Reverend Charles Jones of Chapel Hill. Anyone familiar with this story at all? So back to 1953, the year that the synagogue was um, dedicated in Wilson. That same year, uh, and nearby, near to us here, Chapel Hill, uh, the Reverend Charles M. Jones resigned 
from this university town's Presbyterian church. He resigned from his ministry there, despite the fact that he had the overwhelming support of his parish leaders and of the majority of the congregation. Why would he do that? Well, we have um, his personal account of his resignation. He's got a statement on the occasion of his resignation. And if you read it, what he does in that statement is he outlines theological differences with the regional church leaders. I'm not sure if you're familiar at all with Presbyterian church government, um, but his local congregation, and he as a local minister, answer to a regional judiciary called a presbytery. And so he outlined his differences, his theological differences, with the presbytery. And so you have actually um, an account, uh, you have Jones's account in the collection. You can go online, you can flip through it, you can see what he says. Uh, you also have the minutes of Orange Presbytery. So sort of the other side of the story, right? So you have the minutes of the church judiciary that handled the Jones case describing the circumstances surrounding his resignation. And again, these are described in theological terms. And so you read these documents, and the narrative that emerges seems like an entirely typical narrative of that period, right? There's a minister who is being thought of as perhaps being theologically too progressive. And he's being challenged by other leaders in the church on things like uh, the Bible's authority, relationship between faith and science, right? These were commonly debated in those days. Uh, this is still kind of in the wake of the fundamentalist modernist controversy that made its way through American Christianity in the early 20th century, that dividing American Christianity for decades, leading up to Jones's um, resignation. And so that just seems like par for the course. This is happening everywhere. So this is just another example of the theological difference. His own defense, like I said, focuses on how people found his doctrine problematic. Uh, this is, this is Jones, Jones' words here. Historical study of the Bible shows that it is not a book whose words or ideas are directly and supernaturally given to man and infallibly recorded. We no longer set human discovery and divine revelation over against one another. This is from Jones' defense of its ministry, of his ministry, all in the collection. But you know, it's only part of the story. And this, this example here highlights how our collection might be used, not, not just alone, as a standalone resource, but alongside other resources that'll get you back into the histories that you might be interested in researching in order to get a fuller story. Because in Jones's case, it wasn't just that he had theological differences with some members of his presbytery. But if you go back and you read newspaper clippings, if you listen to Jones's recorded interviews uh, in the, uh, I forget the exact resource, but it's an oral history project, um, you'll learn that there are actually prominent members of the community who were strongly displeased with Reverend Jones's support of racial integration in Chapel Hill. And the fascinating thing about this is that it doesn't appear anywhere in Jones's resignation statement or in the minutes of Orange Presbytery. And so that becomes sort of a fascinating example of how these issues that people might not have been comfortable discussing were dealt with in certain contexts, right, in discourse in the decades leading up to, in, in the developing decades of the civil rights movement, for example. You see maybe code switching at work here, other types of strategies for talking about issues without talking about issues. And again, uh, if you're interested in that story, you could use some of the, some of the primary documents that, that are in the Religion of North Carolina collection and use them alongside of other resources to again get a fuller picture of what was happening. So our collection uh, continues to grow. Um, 
here are some examples of things that are in the collection. Uh, histories of churches and other religious bodies, of course. Uh, meeting minutes, like I said, reports, conference proceedings, these are particularly interesting to, I believe, the genealogical crowd. Uh, clergy biographies and autobiographical materials, uh, plenty of interesting things there. Newsletters, newspapers, uh, serial publications, sermons. Um, that's fascinating, I think, just to be able to see what was being preached in different pulpits, in different towns, at different times particularly when folks prior to uh, internet, of course, even TV, even, you know, in some cases, the radio, right? We're, we're relying on things like sermons, sources like sermons for their news. Right? How is this being mediated to individuals and communities? Uh, philosophical religious texts, ephemerals like cookbooks, pamphlets, hymnals and directories, and again, we're really trying to expand the collection to include not just Christianity, Judaism, but also Islam, Eastern religions, and other, other faiths, really to have um, as broad as possible a representation as we can to truly document the religious diversity of the state. So that somebody 100 years from now who's interested in knowing what religion in North Carolina was like in 2014 could come into the collection, whatever form it's in, in hundred years, uh, and be able to, to 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 look at these resources and handle them virtually, right? Uh, study them, to tell the story, and tell it accurately. How accurate can you be whenever the Jones thing they cover up some of the issues they don't yeah. mention? Them. Well, and that's and, and, and so and so that's where. Um, we distinguish our work, that's a great question, our work from the work of historians, for example. So our work is just to get as many sources as possible, make them as, avail as available with, without prejudice, and let folks who uh, have the interest and the skills and the desire do the work of investigating the resources that we make available and everything else they can find to tell as complete a story as possible. So. We're not interested at this point in shaping or telling any particular story as much as we are making all of these sources available so that the stories can be told and can be uncovered, for example, right? And so, right, so, so, so the last example with the Charles Jones case is just, um, that would just be good history, not to rely on what you can find in one collection, historiography rather, to tell a story, but to, just to ask whether or not there are other voices and other types of things that I need to pay attention to or find in order to fill out that story. That's great, that's a great question. Oh, there's a question in the back, yeah. Is anybody indexing Oh, absolutely, right, so this is a library collection. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so um, it's searchable at this point, so you can type in names and you can find, um, you can find, um, you can find resources based on that particular search. Uh, I know that we do keep a, a master list back at the university with a list of what's in the collection. I'm not sure whether or what form is available that's available in at this time, but we do have those particular records. And every piece that goes in there, I know this because although I'm not a librarian, I'm surrounded by librarians <laughs> at the university, so every piece is cataloged in detail so that it can be found and organized, and that's what they do. And they're good at it, um, much, better, much better than I am. I just come here and talk about it. Yeah. Is, it um, by is it by religion, is it um, organized by religion, or by the names of the, of the church? Great question. So what, we'll, what I'll do is I'll show you. Um, <laughs> so you can actually go to the if, you, if you're interested, you can go to this website here, which is, which is the, um, the portal that we've developed at the Duke Divinity School Library. And you can click through to that directly into the collection. And the way that uh, we've tried to make it um, a little more user-friendly at the front end is to, is to initially divide the entire collection into a series of several sub-collections. Can you go back and have a Oh yeah, sure. Yes. 
Right, there it is. Well, I can leave that up there. But essentially the next slide is just a series of sub-collections based on the genre of the material. And once you click through that and you get into the Internet Archive site, which unfortunately I can't show you tonight because it's down, um, you'll be able to then search by topic, by name, by place, that collection to find what you're interested in. Um, and the fascinating thing about it too is um, nowadays with the technology, you can not only search for particular pieces, but then you can, after that, you can search within, search of text within uh, a document. So for example, if you're looking for the name Smith, that's a bad example, right? That's <laughs> everywhere. But a, a particular name, you could search a document for that name. If you were, I, I know a student who's working on um, uh, prisons and prison ministry. And so what he's been doing is gathering materials out of the collection and searching certain subsets of them for, meant for references to prisons in order to do his research. This is another example of how technology is enabling us to go back and use these sources in new ways and, and um, be able to come up with uh, um, some powerful ways of answering questions that we can apply technology to. Yeah? One of the earliest um, documents, uh, the date of the earliest documents. Yeah, that's a good question. I believe we have things in there from the 1700s, but I'll have to check to make sure, right? Um, the majority of the stuff that we have uh, is going to be sort of in the second half of the 1800s and sort of the early 20th century. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Um, for African American churches, did you go through like uh, associations? And also, if you have an like usually churches have, when they have their anniversaries, they'll have a, a church history. How can the, uh, the history be added to this um, physical collection? And also, for example, if they have uh, pictures, old pictures, or obituaries, can that be added to this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, but, and then, so this is the but part, the, the, the challenge with simply intaking directories and that kind of thing and publications is um, we want to make sure that the things that we make available for free publicly to everybody, first of all, are not being held in copyright to anybody who, who might not want them to be made available like that. And in the cases of things like directories, uh, we try to be careful not to uh, put in directories that are too recent, because they contain names and telephone numbers and that kind of thing that might be, uh, that people might not want available on the internet. Um, but we do, we have approached and we've worked with congregations uh, and we have received from them publications that they've created during the course of their life together, right? So things like uh, anniversary, church histories, commemorative, books, um, so we have those types of things in the collection. Um, in fact, we, uh, I'm, I've been emailing back and forth just this week with an African American congregation that I'm going to be meeting with uh, to see, because they, they have their own church archive, to see whether or not um, they have materials that we can easily bring into the collection. Um, and we love it when congregations understand what we're trying to do, namely to to just make the details of their life, right, their life available uh, so their story could be told, right, down to the future. Um, and and, so, and so, so we love it when congregations come to us and they're interested in participating uh, because they see the value in that. That's a great, great question, great point. Yeah. So does the collection include only print resources or do you also have audio and video? Yeah, so right now, uh, sort of the initial um, uh, development phase, developing phases of the of the of the uh, collection, we focused on print materials just because that was the easiest to uh, clear in terms of copyright, easiest to scan. Um, our hope is before long to be able to take in other types of media as well, because we know that especially in this day and age, uh, there are some things that are born digital. Uh, many things are just sort of snapped in, in pictures now, um, and if we want to get an accurate 
uh, picture, no pun intended, right, uh, of, of, the, of the life of congregation today, we should be able to, or ready to, take in other types of media. Um, we're just beginning to think through the amount, of, the amount of sort of server storage space that will require, especially with things like audio. Um, but um, there have been discussions about moving in that direction. But right now, the initial collection, 8,000 volumes, uh, these are uh, exclusively print. Uh, many of these are published materials. Do you, do you uh, return, like the cookbook and things like that, do you return them back to the congregation so that they can have them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, unless they don't want them. Yeah, we, we send everything back. Um, yeah, everything back. We're very, very caref careful about that. Um, we, we, we take it and we, um, we subject it to archival quality, dig digitization, get it up, and we uh, get everything back to, to folks. Congregations. Uh, the initial scanning uh, worked largely with collections already in place at our project partners. So Duke had a lot of stuff, UNC had a lot of stuff, Wake had a lot of stuff, and so we worked our way through that. Um, and then we began bringing in stuff from uh, community libraries, congregations, that sort of thing. And we've been very good about clearing copyright. Not me, but the librarians back at Duke, but clearing copyright, getting the stuff in and getting the stuff back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have sermons in there. We don't have the, the recordings of sermons yet, but um, if you'll dream with us, one of the things that we're hoping to do is, is to be able to uh, host a collection where uh, preachers, individual preachers, would be able to upload their own sermons. Um, and then we could we could we could make it so that you know, as they do that, they they click they click a license and that kind of thing. So that they license that to whatever um, permission need to be granted. But then we could then begin to document that aspect of the life of congregation, right? Sort of uh, audio recordings of sermons, uh, or even manuscripts or sermon notes, right? That kind of thing. So we, we we're we're working towards developing that capacity. Any question in that? No. Yeah? Yes. Thinking of the Charles Jones case, uh -huh. even more broadly, as you've looked at this collection so far, what, what do you wish congregations spent more time recording mm -hmm. for the future for historians and researchers? That's a good question. Because um, really the answer to that question will vary from the perspective of who's interested in the collection. Right? So meeting minutes, for example, the genealogy, genealogists want that. Um, you know, it's, would it be a cop-out to say I wish that people would just preserve everything? No. <laughs> because I think that, that really allows us to tell the most complete story. But I think things like in the Jones case, right, if we were able to have things like newspaper clippings, um, Maybe even the congregation's own, because we have we have Jones, and we have the um, the Presbytery, but we don't have say things that were conversations or records within the congregation. Um, that would be very valuable here, but again, that's not something that I would have realized until I I looked at what was available and where the gaps were. Um, so things like that. Um, I mean, cookbooks, you know, who would have thought that they would be interested? But they're, they're interesting. They have access to that, right? To look back and see what people were making. Um, I think an exercise like this, I think, makes us aware of the kind of questions you're asking for the first time. Like, okay, from this moving forward, what are we, you know, if you're a member of a, of a community group or congregation, what ought we be thinking about in terms of uh, preservation and archive? Right, in terms of uh, uh, recording, documenting our life together for the benefit not only of our community, but uh, researchers who might be interested in our community, that kind of thing. Yeah? Um, you mentioned, for example, the director is concerned about uh, privacy, not to disclose uh, people's 
Yeah, there is a date. I don't want to guess at it because the, the librarians know it and I don't uh, keep it in my head. But it's it's um, it's somewhere between ten and twenty years is sort of the the, the most recent that we'll put in the collection in terms of uh, uh, materials, uh, including telephone numbers and addresses and that sort of thing. So we definitely have a we definitely do have a, a, a sort of a range in mind. Just following on that, have, have you encountered any congregations that asked not to be included? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, we, we, we sent out when we, I think the initial planning phases, which I was not a part of, um, involved identifying here are the resources that we're aware of that we would love to have in this collection. Where are they? Okay, they're at this university, they're at this local library, they might be at this congregation. And so we just sent out requests to everybody. And um, I'm sure that among those uh, requests that were sent out, there were some who said, no thanks, mm -hmm. either because they maybe didn't understand what we were trying to do, or um, they didn't have anything, or they didn't want to, to be involved. Um, none since I've been on, since, which is since um, last, or this past January, um, everyone that I've spoken with has been very enthusiastic about uh, being involved in the, in the collection. Not every congregation that I've interfaced with has had materials in the form that we could use to give, um, but, there, but there's been um, generally support for the work, especially when they realize that we're not, we're not doing this to make money off of it, we're not, um, you know, we're not, we're, we're not trying to undermine their work, in fact, we're we're really hoping to include them in the larger story to be told of religion and religious diversity in North Carolina, and we would love to have their community uh, involved in uh, as great or as little capacity as they would like. And everything that goes in, um, I believe the way our license works, they can have it taken down any, at any time. So they can request, and it will be taken off the collection. Who would you get in touch with? adding things to the collection or, or other than going to catalog and seeing what you have in the collection? Yeah, about adding things. Of, uh, if, if you wanted to um, ask about putting something in the collection, either personally or from a group that you're affiliated with, um, you, there are brochures on the table there that have uh, the names, telephone numbers, and email addresses. <laughs> Uh, mine and, and several librarians at Duke could be very happy to talk with you uh, or someone that you know about uh, the collection, what's in it, how you might uh, add to it, uh, that sort of thing. Can you share with us what African American churches in Durham add to you? That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. And I wish, I wish that at this point, I wish I had the collection live and I could look at it with you. But, um, but that, that's a, that's a, I know that we have some, um, but I don't know off the top of my head which ones. Yeah. In the written part of your collection, do you transpose it or type it? Does all you go in the way you came Generally, they go in the way that they came in, right. Because because we, right, we're trying to, the best we can, uh, reduce the sort of interpretive uh, 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 dimension in between those who will, will engage these resources and the resources themselves. We want to get people uh, in touch with the resources as directly as possible. That's right, yeah. Here yeah. I go again. You know, like I was, I was sitting here, you know, how well are social issues dealt with in religious circles? You know, like I, are they dealing with homophobia, uh, Scopes monkey trial, you know, like you were talking about science and religion, that was a really biggie, you know. And so, have you been able to see how different churches or sermons are dealing with social issues? 
Yeah, yeah, I would love to um, <laughs> if I had the time, and because um, I mean, the, the, some of the material is there. Um, and as, as as an historian, um, my focus actually on Reformation Europe. So it's sort of this is this is good for me actually to be involved in in, in this project that focuses on American religion and North Carolina in particular. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that somebody who had that particular research project in mind could make use of the collection. Um, right now, what we're trying to do is to make uh, that kind of research possible for folks who have questions like that, uh, to have those resources and they can look into uh, the life of various communities and see how these conversations and discourses were developing at different times in different places. So that's, that's what we're hoping to do. Yeah. Related to that your question, I wondered if you might pull some of that from the cases where a minister or a rabbi wrote to the local newspaper mm -hmm. and on an issue and would be identified in that way. Is that something that can be done? To, to, to see when an issue really rose to the point that someone commented on Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I think that could be done um, in some cases entirely within the collection, but in other cases, you know, again, it probably involves some legwork in terms of searching the collection for clues that would sort of point you in that direction, and then maybe looking in other resources, other databases, other archives, for example, to then bring bring sort of supplemental material alongside to trace out the answers to. The Questions like that. So did so and so right? You know, um, at maybe for example, as this trial was happening in '53, right? Do we have examples of Jones interacting with with those outside the congregation? And we do. We have we have records of that. We have um, a newspaper articles written up of these tensions. They just they just weren't reflected in the particular documents that we have in the collection. But I think um, attentiveness to these silences and sort of the um, energy to go track, track down uh, information to fill those gaps, I think in many cases we reward it, right? That's, that's a great, great, great point. Yep. I'm just curious, in this brochure it says, as one of the most religious states in the country, why do you say that? That's a good question. I need to ask the, the, the librarian who wrote the brochure, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I wonder. Again, I don't, I don't know why it was written that way. But that's that's um, that's a uh, that's a good question, and one that I'll have to ask her. Please get back with me on that. I will. <laughs> you know, at one time we used to say that there's a church on every corner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, not to not to trade in stereotypes, right? You know, but 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 I think it's one of those things where it's very easy to say, okay, look, there there's so many churches, there's a history of Christianity, but that could almost be said of any state, right? Prior to a certain time, um, and so that's a great question. Maybe we need to revise our brochure. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that we did uh, with this collection in order to encourage the use of it, um, and we're excited about this, is we, we actually ran a mini grants competition that concluded in September, open to anybody, not just to professors, graduate students, but to anybody, uh, if they would use the collection and produce some kind of uh, research based on the collection. It could be a church history, it could be a, a research project for their own personal interest or for school or whatever. Um, we funded those projects, $500 to $1,000. And so we awarded 14 mini grants, which we're excited about. That really helps us, that helps get the word out about the collection. It helps to produce contextual materials using the collection so that the materials, the stories that are waiting to be told are actually told. Um, so one of the projects, this is answer Nikki's question, um, Professor Jill Crenshaw at the, at the Wake Forest School of Divinity, she's working on a history of baptistry art in North Carolina, and she's using 
some of the resources in the collection to support that research. And so that, that information um, or information that's relevant to that kind of research is certainly there. Yeah. I also plan to include new Hispanic churches that are forming here. Yeah, and yeah. Storefront churches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, our mandate is to include everybody that we can and make it available to as wide an audience as possible. Um, and so if there's, if, if there's uh, limitations right now, it's on the side of, okay, we're just not able to get out to everybody all at once. Um, we're just not able to take every form of media right now the way that it is. But we're thinking about, the, we're wrestling with these questions every day. How can we make this collection more of what we envision it to be? Or, and, and even how is the vision changing? How is it becoming more expansive as we realize there is a greater diversity than perhaps even the, um, the, the, the ones who drafted the grant, right, five years ago, had in their mind, right? How do we anticipate or accommodate uh, these different uh, the, the level of diversity that actually exists, and so we'd love to uh, include that. Part of my job, so my job, in the, uh, my job as a grad student receiving a fellowship from the project is to do outreach, which again involves coming out and talking to groups like yours, but also reaching out to uh, congregations like these uh, Latino, Hispanic storefront churches and telling them about the work, uh, inviting them to participate, and to outreach to their community uh, offering new programs like these, uh, offering to go over their resources to see whether or not there's something that they might want to contribute, that kind of thing. So we're, we're working on that. Yeah? This is called the religion in North Carolina. But with North Carolina claiming to or being touted as one of the most religious states, how do we find ourselves in one of the most hellish conditions through religion as opposed to spirituality. Mm -hmm. It depends on who's interpreting. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good question. Who's preaching? That's a that's a that's a that's a that's a, that's a good question. Not, and I'm not sure that it's one that I can answer as much as the, as much as to just commend it as a question to ponder. You know, I think that that's a, uh, um, you know, I think, I think as we handle these materials, as we think about what religion and or spirituality mean to different individuals, different communities, uh, hopefully questions like yours uh, can, can um, receive fruitful and thoughtful answers, right, as folks engage uh, uh, resources more thoughtfully. Um, that's a great, great question. Are you looking at these papers and how well that Yeah, yeah, we, we are. I mean, again, it's one of those things where um, it has to do with copyright, it has to do with who, uh, who we're working with. Right now, we, we haven't been looking at newspapers broadly because we've been focusing the collection on the history of religion and religious bodies. And so we focus primarily on Yeah, yeah, so we haven't as much kind of found, like searched those out in newspapers to bring them in as much as we've relied on the records that religious bodies have kept as a starting point. But I could see how that kind of information is important to telling the story of religion in North Carolina, particularly how religion uh, and questions of religion and practices interacted with society and are part of sort of the fabric of the, of the culture history. Just the Jones case, for example, if we had things like those newspaper clippings, which we don't have because we're not, we're not approaching newspapers, we're approaching the religious groups, we could have more of a full picture in the collection. But there are other, but there are other collections in other archives that, that keep the newspaper records dating all the way back to the beginning of newspapers. And so, um, so that's, that's an example of bringing in the in the in the history room, yeah. So that's that's sort of that's that's a plug to make use of the local library. No, and really, I think I think 
I think no, no one collection can probably do it all, but what we're hoping to do is to come alongside existing resources uh, with a collection that we feel is unique and has something to offer to many different types of researchers. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so initially, so we have sort of um, topical guidelines, right? So, sort of related to the subjects of religion and religion and religious bodies and their histories. Um, we have copyright guidelines. These things have to be either copyright clear or in the public domain, so that so that somebody doesn't own them and say that we can't have them. Um, and then another criteria that we had, or another set of criteria that we had, um, has been the ease of scanning, because we have we have machines at Duke and at UNC that are scanning and ingesting this material, and so we begun with sort of published and bound volumes, just because there's so many of them to get up initially, and they've just been the easiest to scan, and the easiest to work with in terms of being able to take the text and make that searchable electronically. Um, so that's, if you go into the collection today, and I don't know if you'll be able to tonight, but hopefully when their servers are up and you go into the collection, you'll see that the, the overwhelming majority of the, of the material are published, bound sources. And that's because that's where we began, given sort of these limitations. But we've realized that to tell the complete story or to make it possible to tell the complete story, we need to be more flexible and open things up. So we're hoping that after this initial three-year funding period, as the collection continues to grow, we'll be able to add to it and um, bring in other types of materials as well. So that's a great question. Yeah. Do you have information in the collection of sermons for about what was going on, what the viewpoints of the civil rights movement was, Jim Crow slavery, do you have those, those views? Absolutely, we have, we, have, we, have, we have material like that from all of those periods. And so I encourage you, if you're interested, you can go in there, you can uh, you can search the collection by congregation. You can search the collection by uh, location. You can um, you can try to do a topical search as well, uh, based on topic, and see what resources come up. Again, if I had it live, I'd be able to do a search demonstration for you, but it isn't working tonight. Um, but you have my contact information, so if you have questions about how to use the collection, uh, my job is to is to make it easier for people to access it. So I would love to. To answer your questions, feel free to contact me anytime about that. Any other any other questions? Um, yeah. So right now there's no audio or visual. We just haven't been able to take that in, but but we've talked about it and we've realized that we want to do that. And so now we're exploring ways to bring in things like, I mean, there are pictures insofar as these pictures are included in these, uh, these publications. But we don't have standalone like photographs, that kind of thing. we have no video, uh, we don't have audio recordings. Um, but that's all fair game. I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that communities create during the course of their life together. And sort of as, as archivists, we, we, want, we want that stuff, and we want to be able to collect that stuff and to preserve that stuff and to enhance and enable access to that stuff. Um, and, and that sort of leads to these questions that I sort of put up at the end for us to think about together. Right? Who, who benefits from the kind of work that we do in Orlando, North Carolina? Yeah, that question after we talked about it. Well, I mean, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that I'm hoping that our conversation tonight might have expanded your sense of the answer to that. Because that's one of the reasons why someone like me, who's based at the university, is out here in the community library talking about this, because we're really hoping that this is not something that simply benefits academics, right, writing articles or books, but really 
making it available broadly, widely, um, could be a benefit to a diverse and a broad audience uh, who uh, have fascinating questions like you do uh, and would love to, from the comfort of home, I mean, you could be here at the library, you could use the computers here, you could be sitting at home, right, on your couch, and you could be reading, handling materials, like Claretta's story, for example. You could flip through it from home. And we're hoping that will uh, encourage and support the research that anyone wants to do. Why is the work important? Um, because if we didn't do this work, stories like the ones I told you tonight might not be preserved beyond tomorrow. Right? And so we're hoping that by, um, by applying the best technology that we can, making it as flexible uh, as we can, uh, we'll be able to preserve these stories so that they can be told and retold and sort of nurture and uh, preserve the cultural memory of the state, right? And how can we make the most of this for our own research? You've asked fascinating questions. It sounds like you're already well on your way in terms of the kinds of questions that we're hoping this kind of collection can resource. Whether it's in your own personal research or in discussions that you're having uh, with those in your various communities, whether it's a religious community or not, um, we're hoping that uh, knowing this is available and something that you can turn to and make use of uh, will enhance whatever projects you might have, and applications you might have. Uh, any, other, any, other, any other questions? I'm happy to, to talk more about. Yeah, if you want to ask something, can you contact me for the contact you or for the... You can contact me, um, and then I'll probably put you in touch with a librarian who handles that directly. But because we've met here, you can contact me and we can talk about it first, and then I can, I can put you in touch with the yeah. person. I came in a bit late. Which one are you? And I know you're not. Okay, yeah, I'm Ken. I'm Ken, right? I'm Ken Wu, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a fair question. Okay, cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yes. Are you currently handling oral interviews, or are you? How are we handling? Oral. Oral interviews. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, we're not right now. Um, but that's one of those things. Like, for example, in the, in the case that I pointed out, um, with Charles Jones, again, in, in Chapel Hill. Um, it's fascinating because you can read his account. He's, he's since passed away, but you can read his account of his resignation in our collection. You can read the Presbyterian's minutes in our collection. But you have to go outside, and there is there are recordings of him, oral interviews of him, with him, um, where he sort of recounts in his own words the events of those times. And so we don't keep those in our collection, but there are other places that you can look for that. But, we, but we're hoping to be able to, to take in stuff like that in the future. You mentioned that you gave out many, many grants. Mm -hmm. uh, how was the information disseminated that the grants were the, the contest, mm -hmm. and will it be done again in the five year period? Yeah, okay, so so, yeah, so we're finishing up the, the uh, the initial uh, funding period for the project in June, so we won't be repeating the mini grants uh, program. Uh, it was actually publicized across the state. Um, we we sent we sent out um, flyers and brochures via the internet, uh, via hard copy uh, to every library, every historical society, <coughs> as many religious congregations as we contact um, to let them know. So we must have sent out, I don't want to misquote numbers, but tens of thousands of packets. And so um, we really wanted to, to let people know this is a resource they could use, we wanted them to use it, and to incentivize it, we would fund them to use it. Um, and so you can actually go on, on, on um, you can go to the collection website, and there's a link that lists the, t the 14 project winners. Um, you can see the kinds of research that people are being funded to, to do. Really fascinating titles. I'm really pleased with the diversity of the projects. One of them is the history of Antioch Bible Church, uh, Baptist Church rather, 
uh, another is, is the, uh, the Baptistry Art Project. Um, one, one professor is working on a, a senior seminar uh, on religious diversity at, a, at, at, at his uh, liberal arts college in Lawrenceburg, um, North Carolina. So you can take a look at those titles and see the kinds of projects that people are using the collection to, uh, to pursue, uh, but unfortunately we're not offering many grants. Again, not at least in the near future, I don't think. Yeah, we're focusing on North Carolina itself. Um, we're funded by the federal government, and but our, our grant is administered through the State Library of North Carolina, so our focus is on the state. Um, and we're excited about that because we're the only state doing this right now. Um, and so we're hoping that uh, as this collection grows, as, it, as its utility, its usefulness is, is demonstrated and people are persuaded of that, that other states might follow suit and, and develop digital collections like ours targeting religion like ours does. Is that kind of work, working with the other states to just try to do something like this? That's a great question. Um, not that I'm not that I'm aware of, but but I and, and I wonder if some of that just involves um, some sort of more challenging issues in terms of how states apportion money and budgets and that kind of thing. But that's a great idea to have several states work together and do that kind of thing. And I wonder whether uh, whether or not um, it might be you can work towards that by having several states begin by focusing on the question of religion in their state. And as their collections develop, then kind of finding ways to combine them, right, and sort of looking more regionally. So that's a great question.